Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on care coordination of the child with special health care needs tonight. Um, thank you for attending. My name is Lori, and I am with the TheraPlay family of companies and responsible for community outreach and education like events like this. So uh, we uh, appreciate you dialing in. We know that there's gonna be a lot of really helpful information for you. I'm very excited for our experts that will be speaking tonight and I wanted to introduce both of them to you. We first have Dr. Zatelli and he um, has an extensive medical background um, most recently, he was with the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh with their Diagnostics Referrals Division. Um, he joined there in 1978, um, and in 2008, he was installed as the Edmund McCluskey Professor of Pediatric Medical Education. Then he moved on to serve as the Division Chief of the Children's Hospital Pittsburgh the Paul Gaffney Diagnostic Referral Serv Services, a hospitalist division of 25 general pediatricians up until 2017. In 2017, actually 2018, he retired from clinical services and is very active now in educating the community and um, also the medical community on, um, on things that. Um, would be helpful for parents navigating challenges with their children. He's also an active mem member of several professional and scientific societies. He's received several honors and awards for teaching. He's lectured and published extensively throughout his career. He's the author of more than 130 published journal articles, books, Book chapters, reviews, and other publications, and is a senior editor of the Atlas of Pediatric Physical Diagnosis. Um, he is also, although retired and still active in all the things I've talked about, he continues to be involved in resident education um, at the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. Um, so we're very excited to have him here to talk to you tonight. Then we also have our very own Jenna Reeder with Positive Steps Therapy. She is the Associate Director of Outpatient Services at Positive Steps, as well as a physical therapist in the outpatient and early intervention world. She's been with Positive Steps since 2010. And since um, her start with Positive Steps, she's led the growth of the Butler Center and then as her, their facility director, and then most recently taking on the role of associate director, so overseeing everything clinically within all of Positive Steps outpatient centers. Um, both of our experts tonight started their, um, ex their careers at the University of Pittsburgh, and Jenna also has um, additional education in torticollis, cerebral palsy, and autism, and um, also training in plagiocephaly and R&D. She enjoys being a community partner in local events, including the Kids Day America and Week of the Young Child. Um, and she became a therapist because it enables her to watch someone learn something new every day. She feels the kids have an amazing, powerful and positive attitude about life, and they never cease to amaze her. Um, so I was very excited and thankful to have both Dr. Zatelli and Jenna to talk to you tonight about our topic. So without further delay, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Zatelli. Larry, thank you very much. It is truly a, a personal pleasure to be able to speak uh, uh, to the audience and to share the podium, particularly with Jenna, uh, I'm honored to do so, um, to talk about something that has been a part of my 40 years of being a hospitalist at Children's Hospital, and that is to take care of children with chronic health care needs. Um, these children are, um, 
very special and uh, they 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 present numerous challenges um, not only for the patient but their families as well as the entire medical community and allied healthcare uh, people uh, the, the community in general uh, and how we how we actually take care of uh, of these uh, patients so what I would like to do tonight is to number one talk about the magnitude of the problems that these childrens and uh, children and families are facing, and then uh, to look to the future and particularly as we talk about models of care, what is the future role of the primary care physician in particular as the model of care uh, may change and I'll talk a little bit about the couple of models of care. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to summarize uh, the facets that caretakers have to look at in caring for these children. So when I talk about children with special health care needs, um, what we're talking about is those children who are at risk for a chronic problem, physical, developmental, behavioral, emotional, who also require more than the usual amount of healthcare related services above and beyond that required by otherwise healthy children. So um, the scope of the problem is quite large. And this is a study that was done uh, in 2018 uh, that estimated there were 13.6 million children with special health care needs. And they broke down, they listed more than 20 conditions, some of which are listed here, but they, you know, children who have allergies, attention deficit disorders, behavioral or conduct disorders, mental or emotional problems, developmental problems, and then congenital or acquired disorders that are affecting any particular organ system. It was estimated that one in f four of these households, uh, or about 3.2 million children, um, have at least one individual in their household with special health care needs. And of those 3.2 million children, one in five, or approximately uh, well over 800,000 children, actually have functional limitations. And of those um, 800,000 children with functional limitations, there's one in five of them or about over 160,000 children who have significant impact on their healthcare conditions. So uh, we, we notice that these children also have increasing rates of hospitalizations. So hospitalization rates for children, for example, have more than one complex chronic condition. In a 15-year study, the rates of hospitalizations doubled within that period of time from 83 per 100,000 to 166 per 100,000. Similarly, a child who has cerebral palsy plus one other condition, the rates of hospitalizations went up from seven per 100,000 to 10 per 100,000. And also children who have bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is a chronic lung disease that commonly affects premature infants, plus one other chronic condition, those hospitalizations increased from about 10 to over 20 per 100,000. And so the number of hospitalizations for these children are increasing, and which means that there's increased utilization of medical resources ranging from physician and, and, and uh, medical, medical provider time to uh, medical equipment, uh, to a whole host of other uh, uh, resources. Now, this is, as I mentioned, an increasing need also for pediatric subspecialty care. Now, in 2017, it was estimated that there are about 75,000 pediatric subspecialists in the United States. Uh, this meant that approximately 100 specialists per 100,000 children, but it's not quite that good. And it, there's less academic specialists um, or subspecialists because many of those subspecialists are uh, only do research 
uh, and do not do clinical work. In addition, so there, therefore they see fewer patients, if any at all, and some of the physicians are working part-time. Well, this decrease in the number of available pediatric subspecialists leads to problems for the families, particularly there's difficulty in scheduling appointments and this leads to longer wait times. And I'm sure that there are probably many families who are listening to this that have run into this problem and trying to schedule subspecialty appointments uh, for their child. So there is the crisis in sub pediatric subspecialty care that's ongoing. Now, people have tried to come up with numerous strategies to deal with the shortage of subspecialists. One is to have an increased use of allied healthcare professionals, such as uh, pediatric nurse practitioners, and also the increased use of telemedicine. And perhaps uh, people have had uh, experience with telemedicine already. There's also an effort to try to create and expand subspecialty fellowships. In other words, to recruit more people into pediatric subspecialty uh, care through, ed through education. Another way to do this is to try to use adult subspecialists to care for children. The problem with this is that the adult subspecialists lack appropriate training in pediatric care. There's a difference in philosophy of care between pediatricians and adult caretakers. Um, and, and they don't have the, all the necessary training in taking care of pediatric patients. Furthermore, the problem with, poor, the, with the poor distribution of pediatric subspecialists means that oftentimes families must travel a great distance, uh, oftentimes to a medical center to see a subspecialist, oftentimes even requiring families to relocate uh, closer to a center. It would be wonderful if we could continue, we, if we could attract physicians to go to more rural areas uh, to provide subspecialty care and develop clinics in, sub, in rural areas as well. Furthermore, organizations like uh, Positive Steps uh, to expand their services into more rural areas because the use of these services of occupational and physical therapy, speech development, uh, and so forth are so crucial because these are the workers that are on the front line. And we absolutely need their work in rural areas. So if there's one thing that I could recommend is for positive steps to expand into more rural areas. Another way to try to deal with the problem of uh, subspecialists is to expand the role of the general practitioners. And uh, in other words, that the general practitioner takes on a different role in which they, in essence, become a subspecialist taking care of primarily those children who have special health care needs, while an allied healthcare professional, a pediatric nurse practitioner, will take care of the well children uh, and let the practitioner with increased experience do the care for special needs children. Now, <clears throat> There are a lot of problems that these children have, and this is just a very brief summary of some of them. Uh, the blue area are children with special uh, healthcare needs and the brown area are the normal population. Uh, many of the children are insured uh, through various governmental programs, such as CHIP, for example, here in Pennsylvania. Um, but there is a significant number of children, less than two thirds of children who actually have inadequate, um, uh, who uh, a third of children who have inadequate amounts of insurance, leaving financial difficulties for the family. These children, because of their medical problems, have frequent emergency room visits uh, to a much greater extent than otherwise uh, healthy children. Um, and, uh, between five and 10% of children have a, a variety of unmet healthcare needs. The, this leads to a concept of what was called the medical home. Now the medical home is a, was a means advocated by the American Academy of Pediatrics to provide uniform care by one 
physician uh, who gets to know the family and work closely with the family that will provide all of the care, primary care as well as specialty care. And you can see from this uh, study um, that uh, less than half of the children with special health care needs have, a, a, have an identified provider who will provide virtually all of that care. Um, over well over half do not have a medical home. So the medical home, it, it is recommended that the, the medical home will provide accessible care, continuous care, comprehensive and family-centered care that is coordinated, compassionate, and effective. And it's delivered or directed by well-trained by well-trained physicians who provide primary care and help to manage and facilitate it facilitate virtually all other aspects of care. The physician should be known to the child and the family and should be able to develop a partnership of mutual responsibility and trust. In other words, that this physician and the family uh, are uh, trust each other and work together as a team uh, to work toward common goals uh, for the child. Now, the medical home also should provide, uh, be available for 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days, so that there's always someone available to deal with the child and the family. And this person also identifies the need for consultation and appropriate referral. And with that, establishes a working relationship with, us, with the referral uh, team uh, to help with management plans and that there's a clear understanding of what the roles are for the consultant, as well as the primary care physician, as well as for the family. Now, there are different models for the provision of care. This current model that we see here is one that is uh, commonly used uh, in which the primary care physician uh, does the, not only primary care, but also manages all of the chronic care as well in uh, work, working in association with a variety of subspecialists. Now that's, that uh, is a good model because people know the primary care physician and they get to know and trust the physician uh, and they work well together as a team. The problem is that as the number of children with special care needs increases, the logistical aspects of care become increasingly complicated. So for example, it's dependent upon the primary care physician and his office staff, his or her office staff, uh, to make sure that referrals for occupational and physical therapy, speech therapy, early intervention, uh, prescription uh, writing and refills, uh, applications for home nursing, uh, special school forms, insurance authorizations, letters of medical necessity are all written and there are whole numerous others uh, logistical aspects that must be taken care of. And when you have a large number of children with special care near, needs and that there are uh, in increasing numbers of subspecialists that these children may see, you can imagine that this uh, burden of care on a primary care physician um, increases uh, tremendously. These, this increasing complexity of providing uh, prov the primary care physician um, is taxing, um, and uh, there has to be other ways of uh, of approaching this. Furthermore, oftentimes there's a geographic separation of the primary care physician from the subspecialists. The primary care physician is in a rural area, but the subspecialists are oftentimes in an urban medical center, and so there's there's spatially distanced and which decreases communication between the primary care doctor and the subspecialist. Well, this has led to the increased use of hospitalists and also special care clinics. Uh, this tends to help alleviate some of the burden uh, on the primary care physician. Um, the hospitalists will work uh, with the family and children if they're admitted to the hospital and the special care clinic primarily relates to specialized care in an outpatient setting. The role of the primary care physician uh, still is there to provide primary care 
and uh, that all of the, the primary care issues for these children are taken care of. So this is the a new mo a newer model, actually the model that we have used at Children's Hospital, in which the primary care physician still is uh, a the primary person ultimately responsible for the care of the child. However, the primary care physician works in concert with the hospitalist or with the special care clinic, the physicians in the special care clinic who are providing more specialized care. And then in addition to that, the subspecialists are available. Usually the hospitalist and the clinic are situated close to or in the hospital itself. And so that subspecialists are immediately available and communication uh, among all the physicians and the caretakers uh, can be uh, done in a smooth and hopefully complete fashion. So the adaptation, the adaptation of the medical home model uh, to include either the special care clinic or the hospitalist group can provide continuity for inpatient and general, as well as general subspecialty or specialty ambulatory care. The, these uh, healthcare workers work closely with the family, the child, the primary care specialist, primary care uh, provider, as well as specialists, and the proximity increases communication. The, uh, this, this model helps to, uh, is available to provide care that may not be readily identified for any one particular subspecialty. So for example, um, oftentimes the hospitalist or those, those physicians in the care, specialty care clinic can be available if a problem arises in which it is unclear as to which subspecialty this may, uh, the problem may fall into. For example, if a child develops a fever and the primary care physician is unsure of who should see the child, then uh, the, the specialty care clinic can do an initial evaluation or the hospitalist if the child is admitted to the hospital and then uh, get the appropriate subspecialist involved in the care if necessary. Now it is important to understand that the specialty special care clinic nor the hospitalist assume the role of the primary care physician or the specialist. They, they are intermediaries and they augment the care via coordination of care serving both the primary care doctor and the subspecialist uh, uh, with the child and the family. So the, how does this model work? Well, there was a study that was done uh, in a Texas hospital in which there was a specialty care clinic actually in the hospital ambulatory area. Now this clinic did not do primary care, um, but it, they, they had Im virtually immediate access to subspecialists if necessary. And so they looked at the care that the children received in this specialty care clinic to see how efficient it was and was it cost effective. First of all, they found that there was a reduced number and rate of serious illnesses, which was very important. 10 versus 22 per 100 child years. Uh, there were decreased costs. Costs went down from $26,000 to $16,000. There were a reduced number and rate of children who had uh, two, uh, less, two or less numbers of uh, components of serious illness, as well as the total number of serious illnesses, so that they were able to decrease the number of serious illnesses in these children. They had reduced emergency room visits as well and reduced hospitalizations, reduced ICU admissions and decreased ICU days spent. So they found that this model actually worked very well. It was very efficient. So, I'd like to change uh, um, change uh, my approach a, a little bit here because I want to talk about the the practical aspects of care. Um, in any time that we care for a child uh, with uh, chronic needs, there are, are so many different things that we pay attention to. Uh, for example, nutrition, and I'm only going to briefly talk about each of the areas. 
nutrition, making sure that the children get adequate uh, calories for growth and development, H how these children are able to get those calories, such as uh, oral, can the children take orally? This requires uh, involvement of speech therapy, uh, speech pathologist and occupational and physical, phys occupational therapist. Uh, should the child, uh, can the child be safe for oral feedings or did they require other means of providing nutrition, such as gastrostomy tube or nasogastric feedings? Do they require special formulas and how much do they get for adequate growth? Now, um, in addition, respiratory problems are frequent, uh, particularly with sec secretion control. Many of these children don't handle oral secretions well. That may lead to aspiration uh, and chronic uh, lung disease. Some children actually require mechanical support, such as tracheostomies, ventilators, and gastrostomy tubes. And uh, aspiration problems, children who have asthma, uh, as well. Gastrointestinal problems with gastroesophageal reflux, constipation, motility disorders uh, are very common in these children. Next slide. Uh, neurologic issues are also very common, particularly paying attention to uh, problems with tone, uh, decreased tone, as well as spasticity. Developmental issues, making sure that children are able to achieve the highest developmental milestones that they are able to. Control of seizures and monitoring medications for seizures is extremely important. Paying attention to musculoskeletal problems, particularly with contractures, hip dislocations in children who have spasticity, scoliosis, and fractures because of osteoporosis uh, in these children. Next. Cardiac issues. Uh, these children may have congenital heart disease or even may have acquired heart disease uh, and heart failure with poor feeding and fatigue and poor weight gain are not uncommon. Ear, nose and throat. Audiology is important and to see if children can hear. Deafness is frequently confused with poor developmental uh, uh, progress um, and Taking care of deafness in children is a tremendous positive aspect of their growth and development. Do children have obstructive sleep apnea? Uh, leading, uh, sleep apnea may lead to problems with uh, actual uh, poor heart function as well. Eye problems such as uh, malalignment of, of the visual axis. Do they, do they need glasses? Uh, do they need special treatment because they don't close their lids all the time? Dental problems are common, oftentimes because there aren't adequate uh, pediatric dentists in rural areas uh, to provide routine examinations. Now, this is one area at Children's Hospital that we're particularly proud of because our dental department has extensive experience in taking, children, taking care of children with special care needs. Next. Generative urinary issues with incontinence. And how do we manage the problems of these children as they enter puberty, um, particularly with uh, uh, the, the young girl uh, with pu pubertal changes? Uh, it, birth control, is that something that uh, should be discussed with the family? Recurrent urinary tract infections and kidney stones uh, are, are not uncommon. Hormone problems, particularly thyroid uh, or adrenal problems, and uh, making sure that adequate mineral and uh, uh, vitamins uh, are taken care of. Next. Allergies, many of these children have allergies and particularly children who have um, uh, neuro, Neuro uh, developmental issues um, may have problems with latex allergy um, and uh, food allergies as well as medication allergies. The um, infections are at increased risk in these children uh, from trachea if they have tracheostomies or central lines, any kind of uh, mechanical uh, invasion. Uh, lead to urinary tract problems and uh, recurrent pneumonia.
developmental assessment. Um, we we were we rely on our allied healthcare professionals, the developmentalists, and the, the physical therapists, the occupational therapists, speech therapists, to help us assess the level of function of these children and monitor their developmental progression and make sure that they don't have evidence of regression. And the therapies that they get in home or in school, all of the therapies that are provided by uh, positive steps uh, are extraordinarily important. And as, as a uh, physician who's cared for these children, I rely on these workers to help assess and give recommendations to me to help the help the children in each of these areas. Mental health assessment for these children is perhaps one of the most severe shortages that we have. It's one of the most frustrating problems that I ran into in trying to find adequate mental health support for these children and families. Of course, the primary care physician can help to be sure that these children get their routine immunizations, particularly influenza vaccine uh, and all of the other vaccines to prevent the infections and because they are at increased risk, including all the boosters that are required. That, next. Medications, who's responsible, who prescribed them, who writes the refills? and making sure that the drug levels uh, are monitored adequately and that this uh, watching for any side effects or interaction. Caregivers are angels. The parents, the grandparents, all require special training. And we have to pay particular attention to siblings who may be helping to care for the children. Home nursing, is it daily, weekly, or monthly? How many hours per day? And in some communities, there may be daycares that will take care of children with special health care needs. We're blessed in children at Children's because of a facility that's only a few blocks from the hospital that has a daycare for special health care needs children. Next. Durable medical equipment um, is always a diff is always problematic for these children, making sure that they get the durable medical equipment that they need, including wheelchairs, ventilators, oxygen pumps, various orthotics, lifts, scales, bathing equipment, making sure that they have transportation. Families may get vans to transport their children to and from uh, doctor's appointments, making sure that they, ha they have all the supplies. And then the social aspects of the training and particularly to provide respite care for the caregivers. In addition, we have to be sensitive to the siblings in the family. These children, the siblings oftentimes become orphans because of so much attention that is given to the patient. And I have seen emotional issues develop in siblings um, who, of children with special, care, uh, special health care needs. Special schools uh, requiring special prescriptions for education. And case managers are very, very important. Nurses, the therapists, uh, to help with all of those other functions. Next. So the, the caregiver, um, they provide uh, have un, a lot of unmet needs. Over, almost half of families have unmet needs with medical service. Um, they have difficulty navigating services, particularly if they have multiple appointments. At Children's, we have a navigator that actually helps schedule appointments. If someone has more than uh, uh, two or more uh, appointments uh, uh, for subspecialists in the hospital. They have difficulty accessing non-medical services as well. Um, and have difficulty actually getting prescriptions on time. Dif they have difficulty in receiving medications that contribute to higher resource utilization. And then of course, on top of all of this is our problem right now with COVID, which just enormously magnifies all the difficulties 
that these families and these uh, children have to go through. So, um, next. Transition of care. Uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to say much about that because that had been uh, presented in a previous webinar. So, in conclusion, that there is a crisis ahead actually going on right now in the care of these children with special health healthcare needs. Increasing numbers of children who require increasing manpower and specialty resources. Not enough subspecialists. And there's a change in the paradigm uh, of the involvement of primary care special uh, practices. There has to be continued close collaboration between specialists and the primary care physicians or the designated coordinators of care. There continues to be challenges for the care for the multitude of medical, logistical, and social and emotional needs of the patient and the family. And I'm very proud to be able to say that I participated in the care of these children. It was part, probably the most rewarding aspect of my uh, clinical career. So with that then, um, I would like to turn it over to Jenna. Uh, yes. Okay, Jenna, it's all yours, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Disatelli. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise and your time on such a current and important topic. I would like to um, say that the children and families, as uh, Dr. Disatelli had discussed, are very familiar to our staff and our therapists at Positive Steps Therapy. It's commonplace for the children treated by our staff to be among this population of children with spe special health care needs. And so I'd like to discuss. Um, therapeutic intervention and how it relates to children with special health care needs and how as allied health professionals we are a part of the child's health care team. These children often have conditions with multiple system involvements. Um, it may include their cardiopulmonary system, integumentary, musculoskeletal, etc. And with those system involvements then are a host of secondary impairments, maybe low lung capacity and poor endurance, muscular tightness and limited range of motion, and overall, those impairments affect the child's ability to function and participate, participate as a friend and a, a playmate and peer, uh, participate as a student and so on. And therefore, they benefit from a variety of other services. Approximately 20% of these children receive um, or receive multiple therapeutic services and 50% of those children whose conditions affect them greatly related to their function receive therapeutic services. The need for services are not only dependent on their condition, they are also dependent on other factors including their age, their family support, their family experiences and education. And therapeutic intervention may be beneficial for the child or family for maintenance, for management, or to assist them with their overall development. The services they receive may fall into three different categories. So there is habilitative or rehabilitative, health promotion, as well as behavioral health care services and mental health care services. The habilitative and rehabilitative services focus on learning or improving skills and function. That may include things like physical therapy, say for maybe a child who's delayed in their motor skills early on, sitting, walking, or overall play skills. 
whereas health promotion focuses on strategies that promote health and prevent disease. So this may include programs that aim at preventing insufficient physical activity or poor nutrition, including things like obesity. And then mental health and behavioral health focus more on the access and supports of the earliest signs of mental health struggles with these children, as well as the prevention and early inter intervention to engage these children before the development of serious illness. Mental health is among the most prevalent disability in children. Um, and as Dr. Zatelli said earlier, is often one that is difficult to find. Intervention by means of physical therapy focuses on limited participation in a child's daily life. And it really can be related to a variety of impairments, strength or range of motion, balance, endurance, pain. And examples may include a child that has difficulty walking because of pain that they are experiencing, inability to go up and down stairs because of weakness. And the physical therapist plan of care is specific to each child. It's developed as a team and a team that includes the medical team around the child as well as their family and caregivers. And then intervention by means of occupational therapy also focuses on participation in daily life, but more specific to occupation. Occupation in this sense, um, uh, being a child, a student. And so examples may include um, occupational therapy for inability for a child to dress themselves, difficulty regulating their input in their environment to complete a school assignment. And again, for occupational therapy, their plan of care is specific to each child and developed as a team. Speech therapy addresses deficits or limitations specific to communicating, understanding language, or also um, impairments related to swallowing. Examples may include a child's inability to converse in a conversation with their peers or express to the family what they want or what they may need. It could also include an ability to effectively swallow during meals or have difficulty handling their oral secretions. Speech therapy like physical therapy and occupational therapy is specific to the child. And again, it work as a team to create goals and develop a plan of care. So how is a therapeutic need identified? Well, it can be identified in a variety of ways. It can be identified by a physician at a visit while they're um, discussing concerns with the family. It could be identified by the family member or a caregiver or someone else in the medical team that is, has continuous and constant interaction with the child. It could also be, um, you know, the, the physical therapist that notices a concern related to another, um, another area in discipline, occupational therapy or speech therapy. And then how can it be requested or initiated? So um, therapy can be requested using a prescription by the physician if it's something that the physician recognizes or it's been a discussion with the family and they determine that it is something that needs to be as further assessed, evaluated, and maybe treated. It could also be um, initiated by the family to consult a local physical therapy, occupational therapy speech, a therapeutic um, service and uh, complete evaluation, at which time then they would work together and discuss as a team the the plan, if therapy is recommended um, and deemed medically necessary, and then decide together how those services can be delivered. So, you know, within an outpatient clinic, early intervention for those kiddos that are between the ages of birth and three, or in the school, or a variety of, of any of those. And then many of these children may also have a need for assistive technology. So these things may include communication devices, wheelchairs, strollers, or walkers. 
The therapists are typically part of the team to determine the necessity and need for equipment. They are also part of the team to trial equipment and decide what may be best for that patient and that family, and then assist in the process of obtaining it. Therapeutic intervention can be an ongoing episodic part of the child with special health care needs, and they, as all allied healthcare providers, are always a resource to families and a beneficial part of the child's healthcare team. Great, thank you so much. We did have um, one question that came up during Dr. Zatelli's um, talk. Um, someone wants to know how they can incorporate massage therapy. Is that something that they'd be able to do for their kids? Well, from my point of view, um, uh, massage therapy uh, is not something that I, I necessarily prescribe, although I wonder if the uh, physical therapies or therapist or the occupational therapist uh, would have uh, expertise in these areas. Uh, and if they specifically do not, uh, you know, what resources might they know about uh, for, for massage? Um, sure, and I think Dr. Zatelli, we, um, we have physical therapists that, that do use massage as maybe an adjunct and part of their treatment um, for, for kids for a multitude of reasons, you know, whether it's, um, you know, calming or whether it's used for body awareness and proprioception or range of motion. Um, and I would say, you know, a lot of the, the patients that we see, especially young, um, infant massage is something that's been used frequently and has been shown to be beneficial. Right, I have, I've noted that uh, massage for very young infants actually in the neonatal intensive care unit uh, has been used. And I have had patients who have come to me um, and found resources for massage, massage and uh, they have they they found it very beneficial. So that's uh, uh, I think something that families may think about. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else have any other questions? Could yeah, I'd like to hop in if there's no other questions, Lauren. Sure. Yeah, oh, and just, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I did have one last one. Um, okay. Uh, how should a parent decide if they should refer to children's before going to someplace like Positive Steps? Well, um, I, I think actually Positive Steps may help decide whether uh, a, a referral uh, to a to the f a physician uh, is necessary. I mean, the primary care physician may be the appropriate person, and the primary care physician, perhaps along with the uh, with the therapist, um, may decide that the services at Children's might be um, uh, more beneficial. So again, this is part of a team decision. Um, you know, between I think the the primary care physician, perhaps the therapist that may be involved, um, uh, and then making making a decision as to whether children's would be the appropriate uh, uh, place. Yeah, I also think doctors is telling too. That's like great information, but I I also think that like the families have to look at like. Okay, where does the insurance work? What's easy for them to get to? Because as you know, we've gone through like this is there's a lot on their plates right now. So, you know, what's easy? Who has evening or Saturday hours? And um, you know, all those things factor into it. And the beauty of it is, is that we all work together as a team. So whatever works best for the family. I think, um, and and also, you know, if there's specific things that the specialist is 
is wanting that they know one of the therapists that children's can provide, um, then, you know, maybe we reach out to, you know, the positive step team to see if they can or cannot provide. But um, it, the great thing is, is that I always say it takes a village and um, whatever works the best for the family is what we all want to support. So that's all that's excellent i mean I, I i couldn't have said it better myself and i i appreciate that and you're absolutely correct that uh, and that's why i say it's it's a team effort um i i just think that the decisions could be made if they could be made locally rather than you know driving two hours or longer to come yeah. to children's um when the problem can be taken care of locally but that has to be decided among uh everyone in uh, um, with the local with the local team and you know right. i agree whatever's whatever is best for the patient and the family absolutely correct yeah. yeah and the beauty is we all work together so wonderfully so um i think that you know that the the family benefits in the in the long run from that so and um no more questions coming through right now, Laurie. Okay. All right. Well, then um, I, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to Dr. Zatelli and to Jenna Reader um, for uh, sharing their information with us tonight. I want to secondly say thank you to everyone that dialed in. I uh, were hoping that this was extremely valuable information for you. And I would really like to ask you if you could fill out our survey so that we can um, continue to provide um, these types of informational webinars to you um, for things that you need, um, whether we're in COVID times or hopefully not in COVID times in whatever the future holds for us. Um, we we want to be here to support you. and. Uh, I said we totally appreciate Dr. Zatelli for um, joining us and Jenna, as always, for joining us tonight and everything that you both do all the time to support families in the community. So everyone have a great night. Thank you so much and um, take care and be safe. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you.